All right, all right. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Clark, for the music, and welcome to everybody on this recording of Independence Day 2021. It is July the 4th, a Sunday, and I am wearing a Hawaiian shirt for two reasons. Number one, when I put it on this morning, my wife says, you know, I like you in that shirt. Second thing is, this is Independence Day. What do we do on Independence Day? Picnic. Picnic. Barbecue. Go to the mountains. Go to the beach. So I decided I'm going to look relaxed. And on Sunday morning here in, in Aldersgate, uh, we're going to be doing it as well. And so I hope you don't mind, but this is Independence Day, and I thought I'd just relax today and giving my sermon on I'm independent. I don't need the church. Before we do that, though, I want to let everybody know that this coming Friday, July the 9th, is our first Friday Night Light here at Aldersgate. This is the uh, season premiere. It's the opening ceremony, uh, trying something new. Francis and I are the hosts this week. We're going to have pizza, and we're going to have salad and dessert and some drink. And uh, if you are planning on coming, please let me know or Francis know sometime between now and Friday, because we're going to be ordering the pizzas from Papa Murphy's and cooking them here in our kitchen. And I want to make sure, A, we have enough for everybody. B, we don't have too much. Never so, have too much pizza. Well, that, that uh, that's that's true, but uh, you've been to my house. Have you been to my house when we had the trustees dinner at the last? I and, trustees. and there's there's been times I've had way too much pizza. <laughs> you know, I, I think everybody will eat as much as I do. <clears throat> Isn't going to happen. So anyway, please, please send me an email, AldersgateRev uh, at gmail.com, or send something to Francis Oroville K. Teach at gmail.com let us know that you're coming and then we're going to eat we're going to have a donation possibility for a mission that i will share with you on that friday night and then we're going to watch a movie i mean come on would i show somebody a movie oh, yeah. and uh, there was people were asking me at the bible study on wednesday what movie are you going to say i said nah 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 i'm not going to tell you i'll give you one little hint though it's a big hollywood bomb and if you know anything about me, you know I love Hollywood bombs. But uh, anyway, it's a lot of fun. We hope to see you guys here. Six o'clock for dinner, hoping to start the film by seven. And I'll have some information about the mission that we are going to be supporting that night. And we give you the opportunity to as well. So I hope, hope, hope you come. And uh, then, of course, next, next Sunday, I'll continue with the story of Esther. Let's have a word of prayer together. God, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you, of course, that Independence Day was started in 1776. And people fought for it. As I was reading just the other day, Abraham Lincoln probably made the most pertinent statement about Independence Day on his Gettysburg Address, about what we are supposed to be standing for as a country. God, we thank you for that. We pray for your blessing now as I read from your word on this issue of independence. We thank you, God. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. By the way, I was doing a little bit of trivia for my radio show. I talked about Independence Day. Here we go. You ready for this? When was the Declaration of Independence signed? 1776. Was it? It was July 2nd. Oh. <laughs> it was ratified on July the 4th. John Adams went to his grave stating that Independence Day is July 2nd. He refused to be a part of any celebrations on July 4th. He even told his wife after they signed it on that day, he went on because we just signed the most important document of this, our new country. It's something we're gonna remember every year, July 2nd. Didn't happen. He was very, by the way, he died on July 4th. <laughs> oh. <laughs> same day as Thomas Jefferson, they both died on the same July 4th. Uh, but yes, it was signed on July 2nd, ratified July 4th. Something else that I learned that I did not know and if you're like me, you're thinking that what happened? We signed the Declaration of Independence. Great Britain came and said, oh, no, you don't. And the bullets started firing. Yes? No. The war 
of the revolution started in April 1775. Our Declaration of Independence was signed in the middle of that war. The beginning of the war, there was a lot of colonists who said they don't believe this. We shouldn't be separating from the British. What are we doing? And they were hoping that these radical people would lose after a year and several months of war and seeing brutality in the name of King George III. This document was supported almost overwhelmingly by the new United States. And of course, that war would continue until 1781. Uh, and it became a holiday officially for pay day off on July the 4th, 1941. And I find that really interesting because World War II was already happening. We were not officially in it. So I want to know what the impetus was for doing it on that particular year. But uh, it was declared a federal holiday without pay in the 18th century, but it didn't become a paid holiday until July 4th. 1941, it's kind of interesting. If you're ever looking for any kind of historical significance about stuff that goes on in our country, uh, go to history.com, it's on your computer. It, it, it's fascinating, the, the stuff that comes up. The one thing though, as a student of history, there's no citations for what they claim. I tell you what, when I would write a research paper in, in, my, in my undergraduate, if I didn't cite my sources of where I got this information, I flunked. So I really wish they'd put their citations out there. But anyway, history.com, it's really cool. You can look it up, look up the history of Independence Day. But on this day, since it fell on Sunday, as I was doing my sermon planning, I decided to look at this statement. Oops, I guess I should turn this way. <laughs> this statement, I'm independent. I don't need the church. And this idea that floats around in a lot of Christian circles that my walk with Jesus is my walk with Jesus and I do it alone. I don't need you or anybody else. Don't tell me that I should go to church don't, or go to worship. Uh, don't tell me that I need to be together with anybody else. Brothers and sisters, I got to tell you, I, I, I believe that's furthest from the gospel that any belief can be. After all, what does Paul refer to us as? The body. body of Christ. He even writes in his letter to the Corinthians about how an eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. They are all part of the body. Paul uses this metaphor to explain that we are all part of a greater whole. It's not an individual thing. It's, it's not independence. It is part of a whole. Today's reading, Matthew chapter 18, 18 through 20. Uh, this should be a very familiar reading to you. I think you've probably all heard it before. But this follows the question about re forgiving somebody of their sin. But if you know of somebody who is in a sinful practice, go to him or her and talk to them about it. If they don't listen, bring two or three. If they don't listen, bring the entire congregation. And of course, uh, that's one thing the church doesn't want to do. We don't want to be confrontational. But in verse 18, it says this, I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. Blessings the reading of God's holy word may grant us understanding. Where two or three come together in my name, there I am in your midst. That, if nothing else, should be enough to tell us that what Jesus was expecting of those his followers were to do what? Do it together. In fact, in the language in verse 18, I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And we go, well, see, that, that's singular. Whatever I bind on earth, whatever I loose on earth. Well, it, when you're reading the English translation, that's very true. The interesting thing, though, is the New Testament was written in 
Greek. Greek. And the Greek has different words that our English translation puts as one. If you go back to what I preached on, on the fruit of the Spirit last summer, if you remember when I was on the word for love, we have one word, love, in the English language. But I said that in the Koine Greek language, there were six words for love, of which three are used in the New Testament. You want to bet that what I just read there has a little bit different meaning in the Greek than it does in the English? Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The two common words that we translate you in most of our translations. One is the Greek word humas. The other is the Greek word humin. There's also humon among others. But humas versus humin. What do those two words mean? Humas is first person singular, you. So if I say whatever, you, humas, by, then I'm saying first person singular, whatever you, whatever you, whatever you. Problem is in the Greek text, the word humas isn't there. Humin is. Humin is first person plural. Whatever you loose on earth. It's a plural. As I've often joked, if we were going to separate it in English, we, we would translate humas as you, and we translate humin as y'all. <laughs> because it's a plural word. And that is what is here in the Greek. I tell you the truth, whatever all of you bind on earth will be bound in, in heaven, and whatever all of you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. It's not one of us individually, it's all of us together. We are the body of Christ. It's not independent, it is in fellowship, it is in union. And it goes on, again I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, guess what word that is? It's also who mean, it's all plural. It will be done for you by my Father in heaven, for where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. Now, many translations take that last sentence and it'll say where two or three are gathered, there I am in your midst, gathered together in my name. And I've always liked that particular use of the word because the Greek word for church is ecclesia. Uh, interesting. Anybody know the Spanish word for church? Ecclesia. The, the, the word's almost identical. The Greek word for church, ecclesia, literally means an assembly or the gathering. Notice I corrected myself earlier today. I said, we come to church, and I stopped. I said, I mean, when you come to worship. We don't come to church. When we gather in the name of Jesus, we are the church. We become the church because two or three are coming together in the name of Jesus. There he is in our midst. There then becomes the church. Otherwise, we just have a building. The church is the gathered. The church is the assembly. However... Why does the NIV say come together? Because that's exactly what the Greek says. It doesn't say ekklesia there. And so I went, no, oh, darn it. Because I have always looked at that as interesting because that's what church means. And that is indeed what it means. The assembled, the gathered, that is the church. Again, the church is, I am the church as I walk down the street all by myself. No, that's not what it says. I am the church when I gather with other believers of like mind and I gather together in Jesus's name. Folks, this is nothing new. It's nothing new. This is not a New Testament concept. It's been around for eons. In fact, today I have some PowerPoints for you. 
there is a verse which I really like, and I wish it was our attitude anytime we get invited to come to worship together with the body of Christ. And you may recognize it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalm 122. Let me read to you that entire psalm, which I had marked. And uh, somehow, my marking flew the coop. Good thing is, I know my Bible. So, <laughs> so I can find the pages. Here we go. Psalm 122, in the Revised Standard, that's actually from the New American Standard. The Revised Standard says this, I, Revised Standard, I'm sorry, what do I have? New International. The New International Version says this, I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of Yahweh. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. Is that really our attitude on a Sunday morning or on a Saturday if we happen to worship on a Saturday or a Wednesday night if we're going somewhere for a fellowship time or any gathering, some church has something on a Friday night and you go there. Are, are, are you truly happy, glad, rejoiceful because you get to go to the house of Yahweh together? I really wish it is. I really wish that we would go in and say, I'm glad somebody said, let's go to the house of the Lord together. And I don't walk in and go, oh man, you're in my seat. Or I don't come in and go, oh, can't that person dress right? Don't they know how you're supposed to dress to come to church? Or we're, we're angry about a decision a church has made or has not made. And we're going to bring that in. And that's all that's going to be on our mind. Can't we come together? See, I was glad. I greatly rejoiced when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. This is closely compacted together. This, that is where the tribes go up. The tribes of Yahweh. Please note. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of Yahweh. With whom? The tribes. The tribes. Again, it's not a singular thing. I'm going up together with the tribes. I get to be in the house of God together with my fellow Israelites. It's not a matter of independence. There the thrones for judgment stand, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of Yahweh our God, I seek your prosperity. For my sake, I do this. For the sake of my brothers, my sisters, and my friends. Going together the house of Yahweh, folks, was a joy to be in the community of Israel. Last Sunday, as we were looking at Esther chapter 1, I talked about language, and I said, that anybody notice that I said men instead of people, as I usually do when I was talking about the Hebrew word B'nai Yisrael, which often is translated sons of Israel, but yet it is equally translatable the people of Israel. It's kind of interesting. Who came out of Egypt? People. Of Israel. But they Israel. It wasn't just the men, it was the men and the women. They came out together as a group, as a covenant community. As you read numbers, this is the, the whole issue. We need to know how many people are part of the covenant community. The, the, the Ten Commandments are, are, are written so that the covenant community can get along better with each other as well in our relationship with God. It's not a singular thing. It's not independent. It's covenant community. There's another one which is often said that people really like to read. Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the mountains from, from where does my help come from? My help comes from Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth. I've had conversations with people over the years and say, you know, I've, I've missed seeing you in fellowship. Or I'll meet somebody, they'll tell me a Christian, and I'll say, where do you worship? 
I always like to know that. Where do they go? Many different styles, many different tastes, many different churches. That's great. But then I hear somebody say, oh, oh I, 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 I don't go to worship. I, I don't need that. I go up to the mountains and I worship my God like Psalm 121 said. I don't need the church. Do you guys realize what was on the tops of the mountains when David wrote that? Yes. What was it? The idols, the, the worship areas for idols. It's one of the most misunderstood psalms I think has ever been written. He's not saying, I lift up my eyes to the mountains and that's where my help comes from because that's where my God comes from. I, I, I lift up my mind, my eyes to the mountains and I wonder where does my help come from? It doesn't come from up there because when he wrote that, when you looked up on the top of the mountains, you saw Asher poles. You saw underneath every green tree there was, there, there was offering to foreign gods, to the Baalim. And, and he's saying, my help doesn't come from there. My help comes from Yahweh. Let's back up. 121, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Yahweh watches over you. Yahweh is at your 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 is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. Yahweh will keep you warm from all harm. He will watch over your life. Yahweh will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. It's a statement about who God is. Please don't take it as, well, I don't. I don't need the church. I go out to the mountains where God is. That is not what the psalmist was saying. Well, folks, we're not part of an independent gathering. We are not called by God to walk by ourselves. We are called to walk in community and walk together in fellowship in the body of Christ. Another verse from the New Testament. This, uh, you probably recognize, Jesus saying this. They had gone to, to Caesarea Philippi. Interesting question as you ask, why in the world would they go to Caesarea Philippi? Because that was a very, very Roman area in Israel. And there was a temple to Zeus. There was a temple to goats. Whose other temples were there? Remember, there were four or five temples there. Of, of, of all of these foreign gods. And they, they called it the gates of Hades because this water flowed out of it and continues to flow down in Israel. Thus to this day, it's actually a beautiful place to visit. But that is where there were sacrifices to Zeus among other gods. There was a, there was a temple to Pan there. There was nothing in this area about the worship of Yahweh God of Israel. But yet that is where Jesus took his disciples. And when he got there, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, Jesus said, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied by saying, blessed are you, Simon, son of God. For this was not revealed to you by human beings, but by the Father in heaven. And then this is when this verse comes up. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. And the gate of Hades, which is right there where Jesus is speaking, will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Matthew 16. 18 through 19. I was in the mission in Carmel in 1977. I was there with a traveling madrigal group, and uh, we, 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 we did jazz, we did rock and roll, we did sacred, we, we did classical. And in this particular night at the mission in Carmel, of course, we didn't sing jazz or rock and roll. We sang uh, sacred, uh, uh, sacred music that, that night. 
And uh, at the end of the night, we sat down, and the priest came out and, and gave a homily, which was really nice. And uh, a couple of the guys in the group were Catholic. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. But one of them tapped my shoulder, and there's a big, huge tabernacle there on the wall of the Carmel Mission. At the very top, there's a statue of a dude. And my friend says, hey, who's that up there at the top? And I'm looking around. Well, my guess would be it's Jesus. He said, no. Well, who is it? Well, it's Peter. I said, why would Peter be? What do you mean? He's the first pope. I've never read that scripture text. Now, since then, I've done a lot more reading on it. But according to Catholic doctrine, these words that we just read here, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. They say, see, that is when, when Jesus established Peter as the first pope. Oh, really? Remember what I was saying about who mean and who must? Excuse me. Who mean and who must? There's other words also. There is the word soy and not the beans. Soy is plural. And I tell you, singular or plural, what do you think? Plural. Singular. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Who started the church? On what day? Pentecost. Pentecost. He got up, he gave a sermon, 3,000 people come to know Jesus, they all go back to their own. That verse is fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Peter, because he gets up, because he didn't like what he was hearing when they were saying these men are drunk, First thing out of his mouth is, these guys aren't drunk, it's only nine in the morning. And when he talks about this Jesus, whom you crucified, has been raised, both Lord and Christ, they were cut to the quick, and they said, what shall we do? And he said, repent and be baptized, all of you. The church is founded that day. That verse is fulfilled. That you is singular. But what my friend was saying is, well, as Jesus went on, I will give you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you, Peter, bind on earth. Therefore, he's the first pope. The problem with that is, that's where the word soy pops up. I will give y'all the keys of the kingdom. Whatever y'all bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Very similar to chapter 18. You see, if... Larry here is Peter, and I'm Jesus. Very well done. And you are Peter the rock, and upon you I will build my church. Done very well, my son. And to you, how many people walked around with Jesus? Trick question. According to Luke in the book of Acts, 120. And they're talking about replacing Judas Iscariot who killed himself. Peter says, whoever we choose must be somebody from us who's been with us from the very beginning. And they heard everything. And four names are put out. So if you got the 12 and then there's four, there's at least 16. And out of that is chosen the name Matthias. You keep reading. And he says there was 121 people there. Peter, I give you. You're my rock, and you're going to build this church. And I give the rest of you the keys of the kingdom. This isn't given to Peter. It's given to everybody. It's not an individual thing. Peter wasn't given an individual mission. It was given to the church. One final verse, and it's the words of Paul. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 again, New American Standard Bible. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy that person, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you 
are. There is an entire religious order that, that verse is their guiding principle and saying you singular are the temple of God and God dwells in you singularly. Therefore, if anyone would destroy that temple, God will surely destroy them. And therefore the teaching is what? Therefore, do not smoke. Do not drink alcohol. Do not consume caffeine. And as I was told at one of their churches, if you do anything that could potentially destroy your temple, God will truly destroy you. And that's been an order that has been followed for years. There are people in Orthodox Christianity that will say the same thing about that. Ever looked at the words you there? What do you think they are? Plural. They are plural. In fact, this time it's a different word, este. Este and humon, which is a form of humin, are both plurals, Father. Do you not know that y'all are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in y'all? If anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy that person for the temple of God is holy. And that's what y'all are. What's Paul saying here? The temple of God is the body of Christ. It's not me, it's not you, it's all of us together. Where two or three are gathered together, where two or three come together in my name. We are the temple of God. You jump on to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where this comes back up again. And it again says, you are the temple, but that you remains Brothers and sisters, we are not called to be individuals in the body of Christ. We are not called to be independent. We are called to be a body together. And therein we have strength. What was that that was written? A twofold cord is not easily broken, and a threefold fold cord is even stronger than that. We are called to be united together, folks. It doesn't mean we'll always agree on everything. It doesn't mean we'll, we'll, we'll enjoy the same things all together. But we are called by God to be with each other as a group. And if you're out somewhere on YouTube land and you're listening to this and you haven't been in worship in quite a while, I've got to say, when are you going back? Because that's what the body of Christ is. And that's what we're called to be. God, we thank you for your word. 